I was born and bred in a part of the Middle East. I grew up watching images of war on TV. I often asked my father why people were fighting with each other. And in particular, I was curious about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. My father, now I think about it, probably thought, how do I explain to the mind of a seven-year-old exactly why this war is going on? Because of the complexities of its history. Well, he attempted to. He told me that each group believes that they have something that belongs to them. And that's why they're fighting each other. Of course, at seven years, you're preoccupied with fun and games, with ice cream, with toys, but nevertheless, other images left an indelible mark in my memory. I saw children as young as I was on TV chanting slogans, and from the expressions on their faces, it was obvious that they were not asking for candy. They were angry, and it was clear that they were going to go to the war front and fight for perhaps what they believed was theirs. Ladies and gentlemen, more than 30 years after that, we are still faced with the same crisis, and that is why I stand here today. I lived and worked in Uganda, a small country in East Africa, also known as the Pearl of Africa, for about 18 years, where I worked partly as a journalist. While there, I became familiar with a conflict in the northern part of that country, perpetrated by a group that called themselves, wait for it, the Lord's Resistance Army. It was led by a man called Joseph Kony. It's still led by the same man. They carried out that war for 25 years, during which up to 100,000 children were abducted and forcefully conscripted into that group to fight alongside these adults. 10% of those children became child mothers. One of those children was abducted on his way to primary school. The year was 1988. He was probably 9 or 10 years old. His name is Dominique Ogwen. Today, Dominique Ogwen is in the dock of the International Criminal Court, accused of the same crimes that were committed against him, conscripting children into an insurgent group. Of course, it is an interesting case because it presents a dilemma, and a dilemma with which, in Nigeria, we will have to grapple with. Today's victim could actually become tomorrow's criminal. In the northeastern part of Nigeria, we are familiar with the Boko Haram insurgency that has wrecked havoc since 2009. There are hundreds of children who have been abducted, who have been forced to fight alongside Boko Haram, who have become sex slaves. They've become mothers as young as 10 years old. They've become cooks, they've become guards, they've become spies. There are other children who have become orphaned by that conflict, who have been traumatized by the war. And as the government says that Boko Haram has been technically defeated, can we ask ourselves what happens to these children? How are they being rehabilitated? How are they being reintegrated back into society so they can have a normal life? What about their mental health needs? How can, cre how can we create policies and frameworks that just target this group that could be the next generation of perpetrators of violence? Maybe that's not very familiar with you. Let me bring it home. Walk the streets of Port Harcourt and what do you see? You see people brandishing weapons. And unfortunately, these are the people who appear to be feared, respected. We see them every day, trying to solve problems 
by showing their weapons problems as basic as a traffic jam, with children riding in our cars, with children walking with us, others just heading to school, and these are the images that they face every single day. This has become our normal. But can you imagine what it is doing to the mind of a child that it is okay to solve a problem if you can show that you can use force? This is how our children are becoming desensitized to violence every day. We face this every day. In Gokana local government area, there are about 4,900 ex-cultists who came out to renounce violence. They were actually helped by a faith-based organization. They were given faith-based teachings. Some of them had been economically reintegrated. But if you are familiar with reintegration, you know it's a process that is long-term, and it is a process with pitfalls. 4,900 children, 25 to 29 percent of this 4,500 below the age of 17. Some of them could not remember when they were born in one LGA in River State, and only in one state in this country. We have a crisis on our hands that I'm afraid we continue to ignore. We are preoccupied with our economy. We are preoccupied with solving every problem, every threat with violence. But little do we realize that we are creating a cycle that may continue in the next generation. How can we explore the pathways through which our children are being desensitized to violence? How can we protect them? And it is difficult. There are no easy answers. In the Northeast, the interventions would be different because you're dealing with violent extremism. In the South-South, it will probably be different as well. But the truth is, we are all responsible for whatever happens. The government is responsible. And I am here today to tell you that lest we forget, today's victim could become tomorrow's criminal. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.